And welcome back to the Cloud Church. This is Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. And I've got a message prepared for you today on something that I think is super important and something I think that you'll enjoy. I've had several people ask me, would you please teach on this subject? <clears throat> and I say, well, I mean, I want to make sure when I teach it that I'm able to teach it in a way where people can get it. Because I'm not going to say it's complicated, but there's a lot to it. And um, hopefully this will be uh, edifying to Christians and help strengthen Christians' faith. But also, if you're lost and you've never been saved, I hope this message will help you to see that there is a God in heaven that through foreknowledge saw events before they were going to take place and wrote down in this book, the Bible, all those things. I just finished a, recently a message on the Cloud Church and on YouTube. You can look it up on how do we know that the Bible is true. And in this message, I showed one of the ways we know the Bible is true is through prophecy. God prophesied before it was going to happen what happened. Well, today we're going to look at prophecy as well. And then we're going to look at some Old Testament prophecies of things that took place literally in the, in the time of Jesus Christ and some things that are still kind of out in the future that haven't taken place yet. So we're going to look at today the seven feasts of Israel. Now, this is a topic that, like I said, I've been studying this for oh, quite a while. And um, I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that, well, I've learned this all throughout the years through studying the Bible, through looking and hearing other preachers. But there's one guy named Joe. And Joe, if you're watching this, thank you, Joe. Joe, at where we go to church, where we visit, uh, put together a little Bible study. And this was part of his Bible study. Joe's a pretty smart dude. And he runs into people all the time that are highly educated. And they say, oh, I don't believe in God. So Joe got this, and he put all this together to present to those people, and then ask them, now, do you believe in God? And he said many, many times this stuff that he has worked on and, and proved, showed from the Bible that he gives to those people, they look at that and say, wow, wow, all right, I at least believe in God now, because without a doubt, it proves intelligent design. It proves a creator that came up with some stuff. It's just not accident that these things are in the Bible. There was a creator that thought this out and wrote this out in such a way that you can't help but see the fingerprints of an all-powerful, almighty God that knew some things that were going to take place before they happened and prophesied of those in the Bible. So appreciate this, Joe. Joe presented this to me in such a way that, well, let's say I knew a lot of it, but he added some things to it that just made it go, wow, this is awesome. So I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. There's a lot to this. This could be a, a 10-hour Bible study on all this. So I'm basically going to just try to give you the overview of the seven feasts of Israel. And we're going to look at how those seven feasts line up with something else that's incredible. That only God could know and could do. And then we're going to look at the history and see how those seven feasts of Israel are literally prophecies of things that would take place in history. So I've got three different lines here. And on the top line, I have all the different feasts of Israel. Then I'm going to show what they line up with, literally, which is quite amazing. Then I'm going to show how prophetically, through history, they work and how they line up. So let's start in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 2. Leviticus 23, I'm going to read verse 2, verse 4, and verse 44. And it says here in Leviticus 23, 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them concerning the feast of the Lord. Now notice what it says, the feast of the Lord. Which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. Now who's speaking? Verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. So God is speaking, and God says, these are my feasts. And you've got to get that from the beginning. A lot of people think, oh, the Bible man just wrote that book. Okay, if that's the truth, then there's seven feasts of Israel that men just made up. Those Israelis just said, hey, let's make up seven different feasts. Okay, let's just make them up. If you want to believe that, you can. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says these are God's feasts. The Lord was the one that mandated to those Israelites, you will keep these feasts in this way that I tell you for a reason. And now in the New Testament we can look back and then look at Jesus and say, wow, now I know why God said to keep them in that reason. So verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. So they're not feasts of man. Man didn't invent these, these feasts and, and come up with them themselves. God is the one that came up with these feasts. Even ho holy convocations, which shall, ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So there is a season for these feasts. 
Now, in verse 44 it says, to change my page here, verse 44 says, And Moses declared unto the children of Israel <clears throat> the feasts of the Lord. So once again, these are the Lord's feasts. These are feasts that came from the mind of God. And God, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Savior, the Messiah of Israel, said, This is what you will do every year. And you will keep these certain feasts in this certain way. And they were probably scratching their head going, Well, why? And God said, No, 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 don't worry about why. You just do what I tell you. And under the law, there were a lot of things that God mandated that they had to do. Back to verse 4 there. It says, They will tell you the seasons. So these feasts have to do with a seasons. Now why is that important? Well, these feasts, interestingly enough, all these feasts line up with the moon. They all line up with the moon. Many of these feasts start on a new moon. And the Jews, they follow the, a, a calendar based upon the moon. We that are Gentiles, we follow a solar calendar. But the Jews follow the lunar calendar. And so many, many times... These Jews had to follow the moon. Now why is that interesting? Well, we just had what many people called the blood moons. And what were the blood moons? Well, people said that's a sign of God. Is that true? Is that, is that what that was? Well, I don't know what they're for, but according to the Bible, yeah. Yeah, there are some signs that God gives. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 23-31. It says, And to offer burnt sacrifices unto the Lord in the Sabbaths, in the new moons and on the set feast by number according to the order commanded to them continually before the Lord. So the Bible says that these Sabbaths, these feasts, were all based upon the new moon. And so a new moon started, then that set a time for when they were to celebrate these, these feasts. Um, go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible tells us that there is a reason that God created the moon. It wasn't just to look pretty. It was set there for a reason. God made the stars and the moon all for a reason to show man some things. What was the reason? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So God gave the sun and the moon and the stars, especially the moon, He gave to be a sign. Well, like I said, we recently have had a blood moon. Was that a sign? Well, you can, you can read a book about that if you want. That all throughout history, whenever there were red blood moons, oftentimes those blood moons just happened to start on the feast days of Israel, and they always meant something to the Jews. It was always a sign from God, this is going to take place. And I don't have time to go into that. But it's all about those different um, feasts. They all start with moons. Now, I wanted to read 2 Chronicles, and then we'll get into this. 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 4. 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says, Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to Him, and to burn before Him sweet incense, and for the continual showbread, and for the burnt offering morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moons, and on the solemn feast of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever, forever to Israel. So these feasts are an ordinance to Israel, and they take place on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. So it's all based upon a lunar calendar, and they are signs for something. And there's something that Israel has to do forever. So what are these feasts? Well, <clears throat> there are seven different feasts. Now, some people say eight, and some people include Hanukkah as one of the feasts. Well, I'm not going to talk about Hanukkah today. I believe that's a feast that came later on in the history of Israel. So these seven feasts are the seven main feasts that I find under the law, the Old Testament law. And, of course, the law would be back here before Jesus died. And so these feasts were mandated in this Old Testament under the law. Now, I'm not going to get into, are we under the law today? We are not under the law today. You can go to the Cloud Church and... Even go to YouTube and look up the law versus grace and see the message on that. We are no longer under this Old Testament law for salvation. We are saved through grace, through faith. We're saved by grace through Jesus Christ today. So the law doesn't save us. We're not saved by the law. But that doesn't mean we can throw out the law. The law is a wonderful book. The Bible says we, we have the knowledge of sin through the law. So the law tells us what right and wrong is. 
I like to say it this way, the law in that time was for salvation. But today the law tells us about how we should live in society. You know, the law says, this is an abomination to God. This says it's an abomination. This is sin. This is sin. Well, if we're saved, we look at that and we say, well, if it's sin, I don't want to do it. You know, I don't follow it to get saved. I'm saved by grace. But now that I'm saved by grace, and I see what the Bible says that sin is, I say, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. So the law gives us the knowledge of sin. The law does not save us. But the law also has a lot of prophecy in it. And that's what we're going to look at today. These seven feasts given by God under the law to the people of Israel are prophetic feasts of events that would take place in the future and in some cases have already taken place already. What are these seven feasts? Well, the first one is the Feast of Passover. Then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We have the Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles. So there are your seven feasts. The Feast of Passover, one. Unleavened Bread 2, First Fruits 3, Pentecost 4, Trumpets 5, Atonement 6, Tabernacles 7. Like I said, some people say Hanukkah. I'm not going to go into that today, or else we'd have eight feasts. I'm just going to deal with the seven feasts that were given in the law. Hanukkah comes later. Um, well, some people say Hanukkah is in the law, but uh, I don't find it there in Leviticus. Now, Starting with the first one, I'm going to go just give you a couple of verses. Like I said, I have to do this as a brief overview of the seven feasts. I cannot go into detail in each one. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what God says about each one of these feasts. First off, we're going to look at number one, Passover. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5. Leviticus 23, 5. And in this one... This is the feast, the first feast that every year they keep. And it's a feast to remind them of how they got out of Israel, uh, excuse me, out of Egypt. It's a feast to remind them that God delivered them from oppression and from the evil Pharaoh and how he called them out to their own land to be their own people. And so in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5, it says, The fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. So the fourteenth day, oh, I didn't write that over there. The 14th day of the first month begins, oh, it should be right here, 14th day of the first month begins Passover. So Passover starts on the 14th day of the first month. Now what is Passover? Well, we're going to talk about that a little more because it's a type of something in the future. But I just want to give you a verse where it talks about Passover and when it is, the 14th of the month. Now in Numbers chapter 9 and verse 5, the Bible says, watch this, Numbers chapter 9, verse 5. And they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. Now notice, once again, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, these feasts were given by God, the Creator, to this people to keep. They are not something that Moses made up. They are not something that a man made up and said, hey, let's just for no reason make up these certain feasts. They were commanded by God. And so the Jews were doing these things that were, were told to do, they were told to do in these feasts without even knowing, why are we doing this? But the first one they knew why they did it. It was Passover. We're going to look at what Passover was in a minute. It commemorated the Exodus. But what do these, all, all these other ones commemorate? Well, they weren't past events. They were future events, as we'll see. So that's the Feast of Passover, the 14th day of the first month. They were to keep the Lord's Passover. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 20, 12. Chapter 12. Exodus 12. In Exodus chapter 12, we have a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 17 through 20. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat the unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be, and uh, no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. 
So this first feast is really tied in with Passover. And so when Passover takes place, it takes place on the 14th day of the month. And this feast of, of unleavened bread, is it starts the day after Passover and it goes for 14 days. And so this feast of unleavened bread is really closely connected to the Passover. And it's a mandate that they have to eat unleavened bread. Bread without leaven. Why is that? Why would God tell them to eat bread without leaven? Have you ever had bread without leaven? It's not the best thing in the world. <laughs> leaven makes bread good because it makes it like yeast come up. So why is this? Why? You know, people look at the Jews and the Jewish laws and they say, I just don't understand that. Well, God understands it. You see, it's all from God's perspective what God wanted them to do because he was trying to point them to something in the future that he wanted them to see. And so he made them and he, and, he, and he beat it into their heads year after year after year for hundreds and hundreds of years, do this, do this, do this, so that when a certain event took place in the future, they would go, oh, we've been doing all this and that points to this over here. But they missed it. They missed it. Many Jews missed it when it was completed unfortunately. So that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, what they have to do in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <clears throat> Make sure I got that right up here. So the first, the 14th, so the Feast of Unleavened Bread takes place on the 15th day. It starts on the 15th day. That's why I have 24 hours here. And it goes until the 20, oh, is it the 21st? Is it one week, two weeks? I don't remember, but the Feast of Unleavened Bread is all about eating unleavened bread. Okay, so now let's go to the next one. The next one being the Feast of First Fruits. What is First Fruits? Well, Exodus chapter 23. Verse 14 through 16, we read about First Fruits. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Now, there's seven feasts mentioned in the Bible, but the three of those feasts, they had to literally come to Jerusalem and appear before God. So some of these feasts they could keep in their own home without having to go to the tabernacle, without having to go to the temple, without having to actually go into Jerusalem. But three of these feasts, they had to literally appear before God in the sense that they came to the tabernacle and offered a sacrifice. So three times a year they had to come to the temple, make a pilgrimage, if you will. In this feast, Feast of First Fruits, 23 verses 14 through 16, we read, Three times shalt thou keep a feast unto me in the year. Verse 15, thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Okay, that's the one we just looked at, feast of unleavened bread. Now look at verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year uh, all thy males shall appear before the Lord thy God. This is the feast of first fruits. Let me back up a second here and try to explain this. The children of Israel were an agricultural society. So when God had these feasts every year, these feasts really corresponded with what they were doing. They were going out and planting crops. And so these feasts went along with that agricultural lifestyle. So you have one called first fruits, then you have harvest, and you have gleanings. Some of them are called first fruits, harvest, and gleanings. Well, when you go plant, you notice that when your crop comes out, Usually there's what they call the first fruits. Those are the fruits that come first. And usually they're few and far between. Then you have the harvest when everything gives as many as it can. And then you have the very end where most of the plants are dying and then there's those last couple of late bloomers, so to speak, that come out. So first fruits, harvest, gleanings, you have the first fruits. For example, I love to plant tomatoes. And it's fun when you have your crop of tomatoes and you're just waiting and waiting when you get your very first tomato. And then after that, you get a couple here, a couple there. But then it gets real hot in the summer, and whoo, I got a crop of tomatoes. I got so many, I don't know what to do with them, so I got to go take them to the neighbors, which we usually do is give the neighbors some tomatoes so we don't waste. And then it gets towards fall, and you say, man, I sure miss having all those tomatoes. Oh, look, we got a couple more. That's what it is. It's an agricultural society. You got the first fruits. You're so excited about those first ones. You have the harvest when you get the majority of the crop. And then the plants start dying, but there's always a couple more at the end that you can get. So these feasts literally line up with an agricultural society in such a way that God set it up to commemorate that. Commemorate the first fruits and remember what are the first ones you get. To commemorate that harvest, commemorate 
the gleanings, the last ones. And that's what the Old Testament's about. You get a chance, go to the Cloud Church, look up a past sermon that I preached entitled Blessings versus Grace. And on the Old Testament, it was all about blessings. And every year, the people had to live right and do right so that God would bless them and bless their crops so that they would get a good harvest. And if they lived wrong and did wrong and did against the law of God, then they wouldn't be blessed and their crops wouldn't grow and they would suffer. So that was all Old Testament and that was all under the law of Moses. So that's first fruits. So we have first fruits, harvests, and gleanings is also another name for these three main feasts. So we saw what Passover was, when it was, the 14th. Unleavened bread started on the 15th. We have first fruits that comes up. Now let's look at the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 16. It talks about the Feast of Pentecost. Chapter 23 and verse 16. It says here, even the morrow after the seven Sabbaths shall ye remember fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So fifty days, there's going to be a time that passes fifty days, and then you have to have a celebration and an offering unto the Lord. Well, what is that that happens after fifty days? Well, it's fifty days from Passover is the day called Pentecost. And that's what's called the Feast of Pentecost, fifty days after Passover. All right, now let's go back to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 24. And in Leviticus 23, 24, the Bible says, Speaking of the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month and the first day of the month shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. This is what we call the Feast of Trumpets. And it's on the first day of the seventh month. So it's the first day of the seventh month. Now, I forgot to draw this up here, so bear with me for a second. This over here, known as the uh, first new moon, this Passover, it kind of starts on the 14th day of the month. So you go back to the first day of the month, that's the month of Nisan. The Hebrew or Jewish month of Nisan. And knife sign comes right about out to here before it ends. So you know what all this is? This is all spring festivals. These are all feasts in springtime in the month of Nisan. Well, over here with the Feast of Trumpets, it starts... Did I put it over there? Man, I'm not doing so good today. It's the first day of the seventh month. Okay, so it goes here. So this would start, going all the way over to about here, festivals in the fall, or the autumn time. So like I said earlier, you have your agricultural society being set up, and during that agricultural society you have these feasts. And the first three feasts are all about the spring, all about the springtime. Then over here you get your harvest. See the first fruits, harvest, and over here is gleanings. And then toward the seventh month. Now, what does the seventh month correspond in our calendar? Usually around September. So starting of the fall, starting after the harvest, when you start to have, kind of like we do, um, you know, the, the fall festivals, the fall holidays, when we all commemorate, well, the harvest is over, so now it's going to start to get cold soon. So here, this is all in the fall, or in the autumn time. So you've got those two seasons. Notice we looked at talking about seasons. The seven feasts correspond with the season every year of starting in springtime. And look, notice there's not very many feasts in the summertime. Why? Because the summer is when you go work. <laughs> then when you're done working, that's when you come do some more feasts and you thank God. So it's like this. You start these feasts out by saying, Oh God, we love you. Please bless what we do. And you're showing God you love him. And by so doing, he blesses you in the summertime with a great harvest, and then you come to God and say, we thank you for what you've done. So that's how these feasts were set up in an agricultural society. So the Feast of Trumpets is over here on the first month or first day of the seventh month. So this is a feast that's starting the fall, and it's, it's in the fall, on the fall time, the autumn time. Now let's go to the Feast of Atonement. Okay, I'm getting there. This is going to be a great teaching if we can just ever get to it. There's just so much to look at. Uh, Revelation, uh, excuse me, Leviticus 23:27. It says here, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be 
a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So here we have a holy convocation unto you. All right, so this is the ten days after is the Feast of Atonement. So trumpet starts on the first day of the seventh month, and ten days later, that's why I have ten days here, is the Feast of Atonement. Now, Leviticus 23, 34. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So, after the Atonement is the Feast of Tabernacles. On the fifteenth day of the month, what does it say? The fifteenth day of the month. So this starts on the fifteenth day of the month. So you have five days in between trumpets and tabernacles. So the fifteenth day of the month is tabernacles. So these feasts are really close together. But notice there's fifteen days between here and here. And over here, from the first day, there's fifteen days. So something about seven and seven, something about two weeks. Okay, so you've got all this here from the Bible. We've looked at what the Bible says about these feasts. You have the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. Three of them. In the middle over here is Pentecost. Then you have over here three more. Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacle. I don't know why it's set up like this. Three and three and one in the middle. Well, it almost looks like a candlestick. <laughs> and, and, huh, anyway. But anyway, so God set this thing up in such a way that these were the feasts that the children of Israel had to um, follow and, and, and do and deal with every year. So if you were a Jew in the Old Testament living under the law, every year of your life you would be doing this over and over and over with seven different feasts while you're in the middle of working your butt off in the fields planting, while you're working as a shepherd with your sheep, while you're doing all the things that a person does during that agricultural period of uh, trying to get, that's how they got their money too. You know, by the time that the harvest is over, then they go and they sell. And so, there was always this time of rest in the wintertime because you worked hard in the summer and you saved up and you had that money. Now, this is what's so incredible about these seven feasts. All right? This is what Joe taught me. And Joe, boy, this is amazing. These seven feasts align up perfectly with the gestation period of a woman. Now that's what's so amazing about these feasts. God is the one in heaven that said, I want these feasts on these certain days. And when you look at these feasts from the first day of the month, right? This one starts on the 14th, so if you go to the very first day, the new moon, there's exactly 280 days from the Passover. Well, let's, let's subtract those two, uh, two weeks. I'm sorry, let's start on the 14th. You start on the 14th on Passover, there's exactly 280 days in which these feasts take place. Do you realize that 280 days is uh, 40 weeks? And how long does a, a, a child sit in its mother's womb? Well, you ask somebody, they say, well, it's 40 weeks. Nine months, 40 weeks. Well, actually, it's 38 weeks. My wife's best friend is a midwife. And you ask a midwife and you say, is it 40 weeks that a woman's pregnant? She goes, well, it's more like 38 weeks. Well, if you take away these two weeks and you start at Passover and you go from here to here, you have exactly 38 weeks. Now, if you add those two weeks right there from the new moon, you have 40 weeks. 280 days. The gestation period of a woman. Now, you tell me, was that pure accident? People that believed that the Bible was written by man, did men go, let's... Um, Let's make our feast and set them up on when a, when a child is born and make them all correspond perfect, perfectly of, of a child's gestation period in its mother. Do you think man did that or do you think God in heaven was trying to show us something? When you read the Bible, you can't help but see the very first prophecy in the Bible in the book of Genesis, way back over here, was the promised seed. Genesis 3.16, I might as well read it to you, we've got time. And God said to, to Adam and Eve, Someday I'm going to send you a promised seed. And in Genesis chapter 3, and verse 16, it says, Actually, it's Genesis 3, 15, sorry. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So Genesis 3, 15 is a promise, the first prophecy in the Bible of a promised seed. And isn't it something that these... Is Israeli feast that God said you have to keep in this way point to the gestation period of a woman. 
Which is what? A woman giving birth to man's seed. You think God in heaven was trying to point to Israel and say, Look, I'm coming one day being born of a virgin, and I want you to see that. Because what we're going to find is these feasts, every one of these seven feasts, they all line up with Jesus Christ. And something that he did or will do in the future, according to the Bible. So this seven feasts of Israel line up with the gestation period of a baby. And it's just it's simply amazing. It has to have been intelligent design. It has to have been God that, that set this up. Man couldn't have done this in his own thinking. And it's amazing. So let me show you that. Here's an example. All right, so a woman goes into a, what's called a menstruation. And it takes a little while. Let me, I'm going to use Joe's notes here <laughs> since he, he gave them to me. A woman starts her, her menstruation, and you know a lot of doctors have found out that for many women, now they're all different, but for many women, a woman's menstruation somehow corresponds with the moon. Isn't that amazing? So you have the start of a menstruation. And about 14 days later, after a woman starts her menstruation, then there's what's called an ovulation period. It's about 14 days after menstruation starts. Now, I'm not teaching the Bible. I'm teaching now what doctors will tell you. Because it's uncanny how what doctors teach about a woman's gestation period lines up completely with the seven feasts of Israel. So if you're a doctor watching this, study this. See if this isn't true, what I'm telling you. So, a woman has an egg. You know what they say when, when she has that egg and she begins ovulation? There's only about a 24-hour period in which that egg can be fertilized. Now, when that egg drops, it can be fertilized within that 24-hour period. Now, a guy's sperm can last a day, two days, three days, possibly. So, there's really only a two, three, four-day window in which a woman can become fertilized and be with child. And that egg must be fertilized within that 24-hour period. And then, within the next two to six days, that egg travels into the woman's uterus. If she's uh, fertilized, if it's fertilized, then she becomes pregnant. Now, why do I have two to six days here? Well, because it all depended on the moon. So, every year, it was a different date because they had to go out and look in the moon. And what's interesting is women are different. How, how many days it takes that egg to, to actually travel to be fertilized. But once that egg is fertilized, and there's uh, so many weeks along that baby, the baby starts taking shape. Here. Alright, baby. Baby starts taking shape in this time period. Well, what happened in this time period? Well, we're going to look at that in a minute. But there was a body that started taking shape. Just remember that I said that. And you'll see that when we get down here to the time period of when things took place. Well, you go over here and you look at this and they say the third, uh, let's say, the baby starts taking shape here. All right, over here the baby becomes fully human in all of its parts. So we'll just write up here the baby becomes fully human. Um, shapen like a human. So he has the, the form of a body here. Now, watch this. Around about this time period is when a baby's hearing is fully developed and he can begin to hear. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? How about the time that a baby's ears are fully developed and they can actually hear what's going on outside the womb is what God called the Feast of Trumpets. What's a trumpet? It's an instrument that makes a noise. And it just so corresponds with that time period when a baby can start hearing. Can you imagine if you lived in those Old Testament times under the law and you were a mother and you got pregnant right here and as these feasts are going on, your baby is growing inside you? And you go to the Feast of Trumpets, and when you do, that baby leaps inside your womb because he hears a trumpet, and he says, Woohoo! That sounds cool. Well, it just happens to line up. Oh, just happenstance. You're just, oh, you're just making stuff up. Really? Really? Okay. Well, about this time, scientists say, doctors say, that around in the gestation period, when you line it up with this feast period, that over here is the time when a baby's blood begins to to form hemoglobin. 
And they say that it just so happens to be around this time when the hemoglobin is fully developed. Well, isn't that interesting? Because God said, it's that time when you bring a sacrifice of atonement. And what do they do in the sacrifice? <laughs> they shed blood. Isn't that weird? How a child's blood hemoglobin levels are, are, are done, being changed, and they finally have their own hemoglobin about this time. And it just so happens that that's the time when God's demands a blood atonement. You say, well, that's just crazy. Is it? Or is the creator of the universe giving his seven feasts and putting them in order of the gestation period of a child because he wanted Israel to know, hey, I'm the promised seed and I will come someday. And everything that takes place in a child's life span inside of a mother's womb is represented in my feasts. Well, now you get over here to, to this period and doctors say that a child is fully developed and can be born early and still survive. You know, there's been children that were born at six months old and they were still alive and fully developed. So, a normal birth occurs usually 280 days to subtract 14, two weeks from that, whatever that is, usually about 38 weeks. And it just so happens, if you start at Passover, it's 38 weeks until the seven feasts are over. I mean, that's just, you can't make this stuff up, man. That's Either they were the smartest people in the, in the, in the world, these Jews, and they made all this up without knowing what modern science and what doctors know about a, a woman's gestation period. Or there is a God in heaven that commanded this, as we saw, you keep these feasts because they all point to a birth. And that birth is me, the promised seed that will be born of a virgin. Me, the Messiah of Israel. All right, you say, well, I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay, fine. You, you do your own study, okay? But here's something you can't deny. These feasts correspond with Jesus Christ. And these feasts are all prophetic of Jesus and his coming. Well, how did he come? He was born of a virgin. So there's the birth. They all line up with the gestation period of a woman. A birth. That's interesting. Now, what does the Bible say? Well, let's look at each one of these feasts and see how each one of those ties in with Jesus Christ. This, this is utterly amazing. I, I don't see how anyone cannot be a Christian. I don't see how anyone can say, oh, that Bible is so stupid and dumb, and it's, it's just not. It's written by man. When you look at it, and you can't help but see, wow, divine intelligence, intelligent design, foreknowledge. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. This first feast was the feast of Passover. And look what it says, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. The Bible says that Passover is Christ. Who is Christ? Jesus. So Jesus is the Passover, according to the New Testament. Now why would Jesus be a type of the Passover? Well, let's go back to the Old Testament and look at what the Passover was. It was a feast that commemorated what happened while they were still in Egypt. And while they were in Egypt, God commanded the people to get a lamb. In Exodus 12, verses 3 through 7, Speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor take unto his house it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year you shall take it out from a sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. And it goes on there and tells you to eat the lamb. When did it take place? On the Passover. When Jesus Christ was literally here on the earth and he walked the earth, when was Jesus Christ crucified? On the Passover. So Jesus Christ is the Passover what? Lamb. I mean, I don't see how people can not see that. The Bible says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist said in John 1, 29, and also in verse 36. Now watch what it says took place here, and I'm running out of room, so I guess I'll uh, just go way... Well, I'll just put it right here. Just make it smaller. 
the Bible says that in that old period, in Egypt still, what they had to do during the Passover was they had to take a lamb and kill it. Then they took hyssop and they took that blood of the lamb and they were supposed to put it on the doorpost. And guess where it says they're supposed to put it? Right here, right here, and right here. On the top of the doorpost and on both sides. What does that paint? That paints a picture of a cross. That Passover in that Old Testament was foreshadowing Jesus dying as the Passover lamb on the cross of Calvary. I don't know if you can see that or if it's off the screen, but that's a cross there. So that's incredible. I mean, it cannot be not. Christians have believed this for centuries, and they know that that's what it was about. So Jesus Christ fulfilled the Passover feast because Jesus Christ is the Passover. So that feast, that Passover feast, check, has been fulfilled as a prophecy of Jesus Christ. The next one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, what did they do in that Feast of Unleavened Bread? Well, they ate unleavened bread for however long it was. Now you go to the book of John, in chapter 6, when Jesus Christ was here on the earth, he said something quite interesting. John chapter 6 and verse 36. John 6, 36, Jesus Christ says, But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. Oops. John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So here we have Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. So what does that make Jesus? That means Jesus is the bread. And notice that the bread is unleavened. Now in the Bible, leaven is likened unto corruption. Leaven is likened unto false doctrine. Leaven is likened unto something that's corrupt and it's evil and it's awful. Well, what happened in this time period that corresponds with these feasts? In the time of Jesus... The Passover corresponds when Jesus was, died, was killed. And guess what? Three days and three nights, Jesus Christ was in the grave. And do you know the Bible tells us that his flesh never saw corruption? His flesh is a type of the unleavened bread. And you know what happened? Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. And when he rose again from the dead, guess what? He was in his glorified body, a body that never saw corruption. It's like Jesus is the unleavened bread. In the Old Testament, they were told, you have to eat this unleavened bread. What did Jesus Christ say? He said, lest you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, he didn't say literally, like some churches take it. What he was saying was, eating my flesh and drinking my blood, like you take bread and eat it and it comes inside of you. By faith, you trust in Jesus and he comes and dwells inside of you. It's by faith that we're saved, not by eating something. So what you have is you have a type of Jesus Christ as the type of unleavened bread. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the next one. First fruits. Is Jesus Christ somehow a type of first fruits? Wouldn't it be something if the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the first fruits? Well, actually, it does. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. It says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that's left. <sighs> So Paul says Jesus is the Passover. Jesus himself said, I am the bread. So he's identified with the bread. And then you have Paul telling us Jesus Christ is the first fruits. So the first fruits is Jesus. Christ the first fruits. And guess what? When Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, it was around the time of the Feast of First Fruits. Now, what happened in the Feast? of first fruits. Anything? I mean, is there anything in the Old Testament that it tells us happens? Well, let's go to Leviticus, chapter 23. I'm going to read verse 10 through 12. Leviticus 23, verses 10 through 12. Speaking to the children of Israel, and say to them, When ye be come into the land which I give in unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you, on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So in that Old Testament, in that feast, whenever the Feast of First Fruits came, what was received by the priest was waved before God. And when it was waved before God, God accepted it. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the Bible says God was satisfied with that. Well, when Jesus Christ rose again the third day, you know what he did? If you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church, look up my past sermon on blood atonement. 
and you'll see more about it. But the Bible says that when Jesus rose again from dead, he went up to the Father. And the book of Hebrews tells us that he took his blood with him and offered upon the mercy seat in heaven. And it's there today, and it washes the vilest sinner clean, the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's like Jesus Christ, as our priest, went up to heaven and said, Here it is, God, the blood that saves the whole world. And he waved it like a wave offering to the world. And it's all right there. Jesus Christ, the first fruits. Man, I'm getting goosebumps. You can't make this stuff up. This was all prophesied in scriptures. So you have those three things taking place. Jesus Christ was a type in the Old Testament of the Passover, and Jesus Christ came and fulfilled that feast. He was the Passover lamb. Jesus Christ is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is the bread, and so he fulfilled that, that feast. Jesus Christ is called the first fruits, and that's what Jesus is. Now, as we read through the Bible, we find out there was a feast called the Feast of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, I'm actually, I'm so far behind, I won't even read it. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, you can look it up. It says, you know, the, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And so Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit came down. And guess what? There was a, a body being built by Jesus Christ, which is called the body of Christ. And I'm not going to go into that now. But that feast had been fulfilled by, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down, like on Pentecost. And Pentecost was a time when you remembered, and it's called a holy convocation in Leviticus 23, 24. Um, well, excuse me, I'm on the next one. So, Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost. All right. So now let's go to the next one, the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Now here's something I'm just going to throw out there as you're looking for Leviticus 23. I have always thought that the rapture has to be on Pentecost. Because the Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost, well, if there's going to be a rapture, then the rapture, wouldn't the Holy Spirit have to go up on the same day? Because it's all about the Holy Spirit. But some people say that the rapture lines up with trumpets. Is that true? I don't know. This is something, but there's good arguments either way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what Joe said. That he believes the September, the, the trumpets, is when the rapture must be. But let's look at this uh, Feast of Trumpets, Leviticus 23-24. It says here, Speaking of the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. A convocation is a calling. Well, what does the Bible say about the rapture? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, some people say the rapture's got to be in September. Okay, well, I'd rather it be sooner. <laughs> I hate to have to wait almost a long ways through the year before it comes. I'd rather it come uh, before then. But, uh, so I'm hoping 2016. But uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, talking about the rapture, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Notice that. And that's not talking about Donald Trump, by the way. But at the last trump. You see, on the feast of, of trumpets, they blow a trumpet. But they just don't go, Beep, and they're done. They blow it over and over and over. I don't know how many times they blow it, but they blow it quite a few times. And so it sounds like the last trump, what if that's being blown in Israel, and when that trumpet is blown in Israel, on that last trump is when the rapture takes place. Well, that's what people are teaching now, and that's possible. Now, one thing to remember, all these feasts deal with Jesus and Israel. And the church, the church age, we are not Israel. So that's why I wonder, okay, if the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost, it'll go back up on Pentecost, and this Feast of Trumpets might have to do with Israel, not with the church. That's why I think it's possible a Pentecost rapture. But others say, no, 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 that's when the trump is blown, and that's because that's when Jesus gets his bride, so it's all about Jesus. Okay, I can, I can deal with that. That's why I put it up here the way Joe said it. So it's possible that there's a September rapture, and the last trump is the trump blown in Israel. And you know what? 2015, Israel went out and blew their shofar. So a lot of people thought the rapture was going to come on September 23rd because it was very close to 
to the Feast of Atonement. It was very close. All these things seemed to fit together. So there you have the Feast of Tabernacle, uh, excuse me, the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. So it could very well be, Rapture might be in September during the trump, trumpets being blown in Jerusalem. I don't know. But that's what Joe said, and it, it seems to make sense. Now, let's look at atonement. Go to Leviticus chapter 23. Feast of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 23. What does the Bible say about, about this? Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 27. I'm going to read down to verse 31. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, also on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a holy atonement, or excuse me, be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in the same day, for it is a day of atonement for, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. What a thing to say that you have to be afflicted. What does that even mean? And it says, And whatsoever shall it be, verse 30, that doeth any work in that same day, the same shall will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in your dwelling. So two things are mentioned. You have to make a fire during this day of atonement. And you have to be afflicted. <laughs> How interesting. Why would God tell you, on this feast I want you to be afflicted? Well, these four feasts have a check mark by them because they've been completed according to the New Testament. But you know what? These three feasts have not been completed by Jesus Christ. These are future feasts. So the rapture is the one we're waiting for next. We're waiting for the trumpet. We're waiting for this feast to be fulfilled by Jesus when he comes and takes his bride out, if it is indeed in September when that takes place. Well, once the rapture takes place, then the Bible teaches we're in a time period called the time of tribulation, and it's called the time of Jacob's, are you ready for this? Trouble! What does that sound like? That if they're in trouble, then they're afflicted. <laughs> so it sounds like that this atonement takes place during the tribulation time. Now, you know what it says back in the book of Daniel? You read through Daniel, it says, So many weeks are determined on thy people, O Israel, to do this, 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 and then it says, and to make an atonement. You see, the Jewish nation as a whole rejects Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And ever since 70 AD, when they got kicked out of their temple, there's one thought on their mind. We need to get back in Israel, and we need to set up our temple. Well, 1948, thank God, the Jews went back to their nation. But right now, they're waiting to rebuild their temple. And what do you think the Jews are going to do when they rebuild their temple in Jerusalem? You say, it'll never happen. They have to get rid of the, the mosque there first. Yeah, yeah, they do. But you know they already have every instrument, every block. Everything is in place to rebuild the temple. They have it all. They're just waiting to do it. And when they're ready, they can literally build that temple in a day. Because they have everything already designed, already laid out. Every block and every stone for that temple has already been cut. And it's just waiting to be set in place. Now the Bible teaches us that when they go into that temple... They're going to do a blood sacrifice. So those Jews reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They do not accept the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. So they want to make their own sacrifice of an animal. You know what? <laughs> That's what they're going to do. Once they build their temple and they set it up, they're going to sacrifice an animal. And when they do, they're going to say, this is for us to follow the Old Testament law and make atonement, just like it says in the Old Testament. And God's going to say, okay, Antichrist, come in and kick them out. Let me show you that. Let me show you that in Revelation chapter 11. So, I don't believe that. Well, that's fine. I mean, the Bible is an old book, and every prophecy that it's ever said is going to take place took place. So if you don't want to believe it, you can be wrong if you want. The truth of the matter is, it's going to take place. Revelation chapter 11 says, verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Well, what is the altar for of the temple, according to the Old Testament? To make a sacrifice. That's where they made sacrifices, were on the altar. And they burned them with fire in the altar. So those Jews have a plan in their mind. Some people say, well, they need the red heifer, heifer. And that's what they want to sacrifice is a red heifer without blemish. They've already looking and they're trying to find a red heifer. I've heard they found it. So they want to make a sacrifice 
in their temple once more so that the Jews could say, well, we are back here just like we were. But Jesus said, no, 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 I'm the sacrifice. So when those Jews do do that and make an atonement on the Day of Atonement, it'll be spitting in the face of Jesus Christ. And you know what the Bible teaches? Look at verse 2. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. When those Jews finally get that chance to get back in their land and rebuild their temple and offer their sacrifice, as soon as they do it, God's going to say, Antichrist, come here, kick them out. That's an abomination unto me. I hate that. Because they're spitting in my face and saying that what I, Jesus, did wasn't enough. They'd rather have another sacrifice of a lamb. And so the Bible says that the Jews will then be tossed out of Israel and the Antichrist will rule 42 months. There's a seven-year tribulation period. 42 months they're in Israel, 42 months they're kicked out. But then the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ at the battle of Armageddon will return and he'll take those Jews and put them back in their land. And he'll kick out the Antichrist and destroy him and all of his enemies. Many videos I've made about that. So these are future. The Feast of Trumpets is future and it ties in most likely with the rapture. The Feast of Atonement is still a future, future um, event in which these Jews want to make one more sacrifice. And when they do, God will say, okay, that's not the sacrifice that saves. It's the one that I did back here. But they're still trying to do that. And now, when Jesus returns, then they'll see, oh, our atonement was made through Jesus Christ. Now, the final one here is the Feast of Tabernacles. And oh, how that feast lines up with the battle of Armageddon and Jesus Christ setting up his millennial kingdom just like the Bible teaches. Leviticus chapter, well I didn't write the number so it must be 23. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23 verse 30, 34. And I'll read to verse 36. Speaking of the children of Israel saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days shall you offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. A solemn assembly. Huh. Well, this is where the children of Israel come together on tabernacles, and they have an assembly. Oop, I should write that in blue so I tie everything in together, so let me do that. A solemn assembly. Well, according to history and the Bible, after you notice how do you notice how all these seven feasts line up with Jesus Christ's earthly ministry and then future prophecy? So Passover is Christ dying. Unleavened bread was his rising again, as though he was uh, without leaven. He saw no corruption in the grave. Then you have First fruits here, so I skipped, yeah, unleavened bread. First fruits, his resurrection. You have the body of Christ, you have Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming. All these line up with Bible teaching. So trumpets lines up pretty well with the rapture. Just like atonement would line up pretty well with the Jews trying to offer a blood atonement on their own in their own temple in the tribulation in the future in Jerusalem. So if that's all in line, what comes next in Bible prophecy? What comes next is the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ comes down to tabernacle with man. See, this Old Testament tabernacle was for a reason. What was the Old Testament tabernacle for? It was for men to appear before God. And the tabernacle was the place where man met with God. Well, when Jesus Christ comes back at the Battle of Armageddon, guess what's going to take place? He's going to literally set up his tabernacle down here on earth, and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And all of Israel will assemble before him, and even every nation that's left that wasn't destroyed will have to come in that thousand-year millennial kingdom before Jesus Christ. So this feast of tabernacles has to do with the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now let me show you something interesting. Leviticus chapter 23 again. I want to skip ahead to verse 39. Still the same context of... Uh, of this feast. And also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in all the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take on you the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice, rejoice before your God seven days. Do you remember when Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem before he was killed in his triumphal entry? 
The Bible says the Jews came and put palm tree leaves down in front of him. What were they thinking? They were thinking, this is Hosanna, the king who's come to rule and reign over Israel. They just got their timing wrong. That happens over here at Armageddon. They didn't realize he had to come first as the lamb to fulfill these feasts. So that shows you those Jews were thinking about those feasts. And so look at verse um, 41. And ye shall keep it a feast of the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Verse 42. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are in Israel born shall be dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I am made the children of Israel dwell in booths. I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So in this time period, they were to build booths. And they celebrated this Feast of Tabernacle by building booths. Why would they do that? Now I want you to see something important in the New Testament. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Here's Jesus Christ. You see, the Jews knew the Old Testament law, so when Jesus came, they were looking at everything Jesus did according to the law. And they were trying to figure out, who is this guy? Is he a liar, or is he really of God? Well, they came to the conclusion, and wrongly so, that he was not of God, and they killed him. And then when he rose again, he proved to them, yep, yep, I am God manifest in the flesh. And they said, whoops. Then they had to cover up their sin of murdering their Messiah. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. And I forgot to say this, okay? I meant to read this in Revelation 11. In Revelation 11, during this tribulation period, the Bible says that God is going to send two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And the Bible says these two witnesses are going to witness to Israel in the tribulation and say, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. Now, with that stated, look when that takes place. Very close to this right here. That stated, Matthew chapter 17, this took place in the time of Jesus in his earthly ministry. 17.1, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, Elijah, talking with him. And look at what Peter does, like he always does. Opens his mouth without thinking and just starts speaking. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. Why would he say such a thing? Because when Jesus was there on the earth, it must have been around the time of tabernacles. And old Peter knew that Old Testament law backwards and forwards, and he knew the feast, and he knew in those feast days, you were supposed to build booths or tabernacles. And so here Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and up shows Moses and Elijah. I don't know what they talked about, but I wonder if Moses and Elijah said, well, Lord, is it time for this yet? And Jesus said, not yet. I have to suffer first. I have to fulfill all these, all these things. But the future... Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he's going to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles when he reigns on earth for a thousand years. So, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, these are all feasts that have been fulfilled by Jesus. So I put a check next to each one of them. But there are still three future feasts that have not been fulfilled by Jesus. And it could very well be that the next one, the Feast of Trumpets, is the rapture of the church. After that takes place, there's going to be another feast, the Feast of Atonement, in which there's going to be some bloodshed. That bloodshed might just be Jesus Christ coming in Armageddon and destroying his enemies, shedding their blood. But Israel's going to try to have a blood sacrifice in their temple. Well, Jesus is going to come back and fulfill the ultimate, sac uh, the ultimate feast, the last feast when he comes to tabernacle with men, when he comes to dwell on earth for a thousand years. So I've done the best I could. I hope that you can understand this. I, I know if you're not saved, you probably look at this and go, what's he talking about? But if you are saved and you are a Christian, you're probably excited right now. Well, wow! And it's amazing to see how all that Old Testament was written for a purpose. You see, we're not under the Old Testament for salvation today, but that doesn't mean we don't read it. We do read it because it's not just a law for those people to follow. It's prophecy of future events. And those future events will soon take place today. So we've got these three feasts, and we're waiting to see them fulfilled. And I tell you, we are close. We are close because the Jews are already in their land. It's 1948. And you go back to Daniel, it says 70 years 
are determined upon thy people, O Israel. Well, 70 years of them being in their land would be 2018. That's going to be a big date for the Jews, 2018. Sounds like to me something big's going to happen in 2018. I don't know exactly what, but the Bible says 70 years. Well, you go to Psalms, I believe it's 90 and verse 10. It says that a generation, well, let's look at it. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10, if I remember correctly. In Psalms chapter 90, I was just looking at this the other day. You have a really weird verse. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. That's seventy years. That's a generation. And if by reason of strength, that'd be fourscore years. So if you're really strong, you make it to eighty, it says. Yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off. Now look how this verse ends. And we fly away. <laughs> he says, yeah, a generation is seventy years, and if you're real strong, eighty. But then you'll be cut off, then you die, and we all fly away. What's he talking about? Who's flying away? Well, at the rapture, somebody's flying out of here at the last trump. So, could it be the rapture's in 2018? I don't know. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I am saying it's interesting that the Bible teaches that at the church age, the church age will end at the rapture, and God will go back to dealing with Israel. And yet, we see in the church age, God going back slowly with Israel by giving their nation back to them in 1948. All that lacks for this next feast to come is the rapture. And then that next one could come quickly, the blood atonement. And then the next one will come within seven years, because the tribulation is a seven-year period. So these three feasts are future, and they're coming soon. Are you ready, friend? I just preached a message. Are we in the last days? If you haven't seen that, go see it, because everything that's taking place in the world today is pointing to Jesus coming soon at the rapture, and soon at Armageddon. And between the rapture and Armageddon is seven years. What happens in those seven years? Don't have time to go into it. You have to see that uh, video, uh, Are We in the Last Days? Because I go into it in that time and show you exactly what takes place in that seven-year period. It's a time when the Antichrist comes and reigns, and he's assassinated, and he ends up with his, with his right eye being withered. And it's a time when he takes over Jerusalem and kicks the true Jews out, and they're defended by God. But thank God! It will all end with Jesus at Armageddon. And that will be when Jesus fulfills the final feasts. And then you have the Feast of Hanukkah. A celebration. Yeah, you'll be celebrating when Jesus is in his kingdom. Oh, you'll be celebrating and saying, Thank God the Messiah has come. And there is peace and there is righteousness on the earth. So if you're saved, thank God that you're saved. I appreciate you watching this. I hope this has been an encouragement to you and an edifying. I hope it encourages you to study these feasts even more. I, I did the best I could. Like I said, there's, there's a lot I probably don't know about this. I just tried to put out a, a basic, simple idea so you can get an overview of the seven feasts. And if you're lost, why don't you get saved? Please, come to Jesus Christ before it's too late. Jesus saves. He wants to save you. He wants to take you at the rapture. Don't get left behind. Come to Jesus Christ as your Savior. All right, we'll see you next time at thecloudchurch.org.